Um, anyone who joins this meeting, please, um, when you're called upon to speak, please state your name and your, your address. Uh, the way this is gonna go is we're going to um, have the applicants uh, present first, and then um, um, the order of questions and comments is going to be from the planning board. Uh, any town officials who are here, any department heads from the town who are here, any abutters who are here, and then the general public uh, to speak at a public hearing, you need to be recognized by the chair. So please raise your hand or indicate in the chat that you would like to speak and I'll call on you. Um, that's otherwise, please stay muted. So we're going to turn it over at this point to either whoever is speaking for Roaring Glen Farms or the Roaring Glen Farms representatives who are here tonight. My name is Tom Lesser. I'm going to speak on behalf of the applicant. I reside in Conway. My office address is 39 Main Street in Northampton. My Conway address is 195 South Park Road. And we're here tonight because Roaring Glen Farms submitted an application to the board to amend its special permit and is requesting the board to grant a waiver under section 1102 of the Conway Zoning Board bylaws from compliance with section 11.5R of the Conway Zoning Bylaws. Um, section 11.2 allows the planning board in any particular case where such action is in the public interest and not inconsistent with the intent purposes of this article to waive strict compliance with the requirements of the bylaw, which would include section 11.5 R. 11.5R is a strange, in my opinion, section having a, lot, having a fair amount of experience in this field. Um, when I go through the bylaws of towns in Franklin County, the only other town that is a similar bylaw is Waitley. Understand that it was picked up from some sort of model bylaws uh, given by perhaps the Franklin County Cooperative Planning Office. In any case, 11.R states that a special permit shall lapse upon any transfer of ownership or legal interest of more than 10%. It doesn't have a provision for including other people, it doesn't have any standards for including any ownership or, or legal interest of more than 10%. It simply says that if you transfer more than 10%, the ownership laps and you have to be in the process again. And the process basically to get a special permit and to get approval by the Cannabis Control Commission, which has been done in this case, is an expensive process which takes approximately two years. So we're asking for a, a waiver from that. The reality is that starting a cannabis cultivation business is a very expensive proposition. And unless you start off by being a multimillionaire at some point during this process, you have to include someone who invests in your organization, your entity that is grow, going to grow the marijuana. That's a reality. It's a, it's a, it's a, there are just incredible regulations concerning security, concerning going from the seed to the retail in terms of every plant of marijuana and all that adds up to a lot of money, which an individual, again, unless they're 
really have many millions of dollars um, cannot undertake. So we're asking for a waiver from that. We're not asking for any waivers from what you've already said is how the farm should be run. You have very specific conditions that have been imposed. We're not asking for a waiver from any of those conditions. And in starting off by saying why, I guess I'd call your attention to town council's opinion last July in which he said, quote, what has concerned me from the beginning, however, is the question of why the planning board should be concerned about these transfers in the first place. And this was in regard, he was responding to a number of questions about proposed transfers. And he goes on to say the Cannabis Control Commission, CCC already has detailed regulations in place to deal with changes in the ownership or control of a marijuana establishment. The 935 CMR 500.104, one in parentheses. Mm. I believe that the CCC has the resources and is better equipped to vet any proposed new owner or stakeholder of a marijuana establishment than the planning board is. The regulations also use the 10% figure as the threshold for further inquiry. Why does the town care about the internal financial structure of a marijuana establishment, parentheses, aside from knowing the identity and address of all owners, and parentheses, when the state already undertakes a vital role in vetting any new owners of the business? And I think that's what this is all about. Whether or not the planning board has any stake in knowing who either who benefits financially or who loses financially. Yeah. And I say in the memorandum that I submit, I don't think it matters whether or not John Moore, Lisa Gustafson, Elon Musk, or Jeff Bezos <laughs> stake in Roaring Land Farms LLC. What's important to the neighborhood is how does the farm operate? If the farm operates in accordance with the conditions the planning board has set forth, it doesn't matter one iota who owns it. It will have no effect in the neighborhood, whether someone rich, somebody poor, somebody white, somebody black, any, it doesn't matter who they are, who owns it. Um, now, in terms of the bylaw talks about waivers that are not inconsistent with the intent and purpose of the article. And I'd suggest that when you go to the intent and purpose section of this bylaw, it says, it is the purpose of this bylaw to promote public health, safety, and general welfare and to support the availability of recreational and medical marijuana in accordance with state law and regulations. Well, who owns it? The particular people who happen to own it or have an interest in it have nothing to do with the promotion of public health, safety, and general welfare. And to the contrary, to allow people to have an interest in it supports the availability of recreational marijuana. Because without having additional investors, there will be no availability of recreational marijuana. And then it goes on to say to mitigate potential impacts to adjacent areas in the environment, this bylaw quote, this bylaw will, this is all in quotes, regulate the locations and site development to promote safe, attractive business areas, prevent crime, maintain property values, et cetera, et cetera. Talks about regulating the locations and site development of marijuana establishments. Again, 
or maybe for the first time, this bylaw has the section we're requesting a waiver from has nothing to do with the location or site development. And the, well, that's consistent with general laws chapter 94C, which allows municipalities to regulate in the first place. 94G section three states that a bylaw, a municipal bylaw in order to be valid must govern the time, place and manner of marijuana establishment operations. And I point out the word operations to you. It doesn't say the time, manner, and place of marijuana establishments. Even if it did, it probably just would not meet it because time means the hours of operation. Roy and Glenn said what they were in its application, you approved it. Place means the location. Again, Roy and Book gave the location. And manner means how a facility is operated or functions. And you address that in E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, and O of your bylaws. And the key word in the statute, in the, in the state statute, is marijuana operations. And that means how an organization functions. Not who controls the organization. So this really has nothing to do with whether or not Roaring Glen is a craft, considered a craft cooperative by the Cannabis Control Commission. It applied for one, it is, it has certain things it has to do in order to meet those regulations. All the members have to be residents of Massachusetts for at least 12 months. Um, it has to ha abide by certain principles of democracy involved in cooperatives. But a, co a cooperative can be organized as an LLC, and that's what's happened in this case. And again, if we're going to have, if we're going to have marijuana establishments, we're going to have marijuana establishments that have investment. And it's impracticable also to just have to come back every time there's a new farmer who gets involved or a new investor who gets involved. And town council suggested also that in his opinion, although he couldn't say definitively, that the law likely 11R, 11R, 11.5R would be inconsistent because it's already preempted by the Cannabis Control Commission regulations. So for those reasons, I just don't think the interest that the, the board has any interest in determining who owns it. Uh, maybe somebody can educate me on that, but there's no standards for ownership set forth in the bylaw. It has nothing to do with the manner means of, of how it's operated, who controls, who makes those decisions is immaterial to the manner and means and it's immaterial ultimately to the purposes that the, the town voted on that you set forth in the bylaw, which is to regulate the locations and site development. And ownership has nothing to do with relocations or site development. So for those reasons, and I'm happy to take questions, we'd ask that we be granted a waiver because it's consistent with the bylaws themselves. Thank you, Tom. Um, for anyone who's joining us now, uh, if you could be sure to sign in in the chat with your name and uh, address, that'd be great. Uh, or if you're going to be speaking, please speak uh, first with giving your name and address. 
um, you do have to be called on by me to speak. So you'd have to raise your hand or uh, ask in the chat to be recognized. And there's Joe asking to be recognized. So I'm going to recognize Joe. Um, thank you. Thank you, Beth. And maybe for the record, I, you should state that I'm also a voting member because of the um, yes, for the record, Joe Stragowski is a is a um, a voting member for this uh, particular um, hearing and the um, matter at hand. Um, I guess I'd like to address uh, some of Tom's specific comments. The special permit that we issued was issued to Warren Glen Farms LLC and Lisa and John as owners and managers of the LLC, and they are also the owner of the farm. It, it was my assumption that, that we could ask to have a amendment or a new special permit, depending on the situation, if the ownership of the LLC changed. Not, I agree with it, the 10% is obviously an overkill, but it seems to me that if John and Lisa sell the farm and give up the business, the town should have the right to either amend the special permit or issue a new one. If you're near the end of the five year period, you're probably not gonna amend it. You're probably gonna ask for a new one, but early on, you might wanna just amend it. Amend it. So I, to me, there's a point where they give up, let's say more than 49% or 50% of their ownership. Um, that the town has the right to, to uh, request a new special permit. Regardless of all the things that Tom said, and I don't, I'm not gonna take a position on whether it's legal or not legal. I'm just saying the town should have the right to uh, ask for a special a change in the special permit if the ownership of the LLC or the farm changes. And I'd like to have Tom address that. Well, the applicant was Roaring Lens Farm LLC. Let me start off with that. The owners of the property were Lisa and John. So it was the LLC that was the applicant. John and Lisa were not the applicant. So I'd start off by suggesting that more precisely, that's what happened in this case. And when they applied as Roaring Glen Farms LLC, that is not something that is going to change. It's not expected to change. And if it did change, then of course you'd be entitled to revoke the, revoke the special permit and request they begin the process again. What I'm talking about is whether or not they can include other people as members of the LLC. There was no, there was the, it was the LLC that applied. It was not Lisa and John. If Lisa and John had applied individually, that might be another question. Again, it comes down to whether or why it matters. Why does it matter whether Lisa and John own it or, or I become a 20% owner? Uh, um, uh, George has a question. Um, John, Joe, does that, does that answer your uh, question? No, I'm okay for now. Yeah, yeah, I have a few questions, follow-ups on that, but I'm going to call on George next. George Force here next. Well, if you want to follow up on this line of question, that's fine. I can wait. Whoops. Sure. Are it's you your hearing call, me? <laughs> yeah, you can. Sorry, I got muted myself. Yes, no, you can. Why don't you ask your question? I... Okay. Um, and then there's more than one, so we may go off on tangents if that's okay. If it gets too tangential, just reel me in. Okay. Um, and and Tom, forgive me because I'm new to the board and I may be missing some background. But why are we talking about the change in ownership? Is is that something that's being contemplated or something that's that's happened? No, it hasn't happened because the license law I mean, automatically revoked if it happened if it was more than four percent. According but, to but presumably, it's, um, it's presumably, being, it's being it's being it's being thought about because money is needed in order to get the farm up and running. Yes. Okay. So 
so it's being contemplated, and and they're, the the owners, the current owners are are being uh, dutiful and and coming to the planning board because that's what the the laws say they should do. Um, the the related question, I guess, is um, my, it comes from my lack of understanding of how the cooperative aspect of this works. Um, as a craft cooperative, I couldn't see anything in the in the uh, uh, cannabis commission information online that explains how a cooperative works here. Normally, I think of a cooperative as, as an organization that has many members, um, maybe an unlimited number of members. Um, and it, it seemed to me that the, the, the nature of a cooperative sort of mitigates against that this provision in our bylaw that, that you know, by, by its nature, you would add members uh, on, on a regular basis. Um, but is that what's happening here? The cooperative is growing? The cooperative wants to grow, I'd say, George. The cooperative doesn't have the ability to grow at the present time. It wants to grow. It wants to add members who would be... But every time voting, a member is members. added, every time you add members, though, presumably you'd have to come back to the planning board and if you were to comply with the, the law as it's written? Correct. And you'd have to come back and you'd have to um, ask the planning board to add a member. You'd go through the special permit provision, yeah, amendment provision, that in itself, you, I think you have a hundred and some days to make a decision. You have to advertise, which takes months. So it's a six yeah. month process and you, and you might say no. I mean, I'm not sure why you're interested in who's there, but if you are interested there and you're not interested in granting a waiver, then I'd suggest that there's the possibility that you, you might say no to someone. And I'm not sure why you would say no to somebody. And these are pretty extended negotiations when someone come, becomes part of a cooperative and pays money to do that. And are they willing to go through the negotiations and wait six months? Um, also, Tom, the, the implication has been that um, uh, if new co-op members join, that, that they would have their, their involvement with the uh, LLC would have to be approved by the Cannabis Commission. Is that correct? Yes, it has to be approved by the Cannabis Commission, who has a whole vetting process in order to approve members. They go through a background check, which is pretty extensive, to make sure that they're not a, they're a suitable person to be able mm -hmm. to hold a cannabis license in Massachusetts. There's many disqualifications. And they want to make sure that it doesn't meet any of those disqualifications. And if the provision in the local uh, ordinance didn't exist, the only way townspeople would know who was operating the farm uh, would be to go to the Cannabis Commission website and dig around? Well, anytime, we'd have to be approved. Yeah. Um, I, I assume the Cannabis Control Commission tells local municipalities when there's something that involves them before the board. I can't swear to that. Yeah. It's a public agenda and, and the public agenda before anything is approved, there is a public agenda. And you could also, you could also ask, and, and, and on a, Roy and Glenn wouldn't have any objection to having a condition placed on it that each and every time that they went to the Cannabis Control Commission that they would notify the town beforehand. Right. That would seem like a totally reasonable thing to me. Um, and, and you asked uh, rhetorically earlier, you know, why it mattered that we, we knew who operated the farm. And I guess I'd, I'd argue that, you know, if it was Jeff Bezos, I probably would be okay with that. Um, but if it was my cousin Guido, who's into some really sh shady deals, um, mm -hmm. I might be interested because because his, the nature of his, uh, the conduct of his life is such that, that I'd be worried about how he would operate the farm. So, I, you know, I think there's, there is a legitimate reason why town officials or townspeople might care to know how any business in town, you know, uh, who, who's involved in those, those operations. Um, Although the town obviously doesn't have any ability or right to know who opens a business in Conway, when, if they have a lease or they own the property. But I agree. Yeah. Your cousin Guido, though, 
would be investigated by the Cannabis Control Commission, <laughs> and from what you're suggesting, it would not be approved. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. You'd and you know, but I mean, first. I mean, you might like Jeff Bezos, but some people hate Elon Musk. You know, you might right. say, well, we don't want him. He's um, a jerk. The other, the other question. This is really tangential, uh, Tom. Is uh, who's Matthew Martin? Um. Why, why do you ask that? Because I don't know who Matthew Martin is. Oh, he shows up in some of the early uh, applications before the Cannabis Commission as a, um, uh, I think the term is manager of the farm. Oh, he was, he was, I'm sorry, he was somebody who was uh, going to be involved initially and left the business quickly. Okay. So he has absolutely so, nothing to do with it. So by the time the application came to the planning board, he had left the scene? Yes. Okay. That's the end of my questions, Beth, for now. Thanks, George. Um, I guess I, I have a comment, which is that I, I'm, it's kind of a question as well. I'm just reflecting back to our previous uh, special permit hearings and our deliberations. And I think for myself, the um, confusion here lies in my own assumptions about what a co-op meant, what it meant. And um, through maybe my own failure to ask clarifying questions or Roaring Land Farms um, failure to provide clarifying information, I think I was not the only planning board member not to understand that and, and that, uh, that this would, um, that our bylaws would be in direct opposition to uh, uh, this business model. So it's just confusing to me why this didn't come up before. And maybe it just, it just didn't because it didn't. Um, so that's really my only comment here. And if, I, I'm not really expecting an answer. I'm just noting that much was made of the fact that this was um, the kind of business that it was going to be, that it specifically was not, you know, a large multinational corporation, that we uh, were giving it a lot of, assigning it a lot of value, basically because the owners were two local people. I mean, a lot of, a lot was made of this. And so I think that's why this is hard to grapple with for me personally. So that's kind of my comment on this for right now. I do, I just say that that co-op co-ops uh, by the regulations of the Cannabis Control Commission can't be multinational corporations. Multinational corporations can't have an interest in a co-op. They have to be Massachusetts residents for at least 12 months. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for that. Um, Joe has a question. Um, in the interest of compromise, if, if we did put in, if we changed the 10% to 50%, would, would the problem go away, Tom? In other words, if, if we reserve the right to amend the special permit, should they sell the corporation or the LLC or the property, uh, would, would that satisfy your needs? Well, I mean, there are two different things. One is this the, the sale of the property, okay? Um, and the other is who's in control of the LLC. And I don't think it matters whether it's 49% or 60%, Joe. If there's a person who owns it, other who has control of it, other than Lisa and John at some point in the future, that's not their intention, believe me. Uh, but their intention is to get up and going and in order to do that, they need some financing. And if they need financing, they need someone, the people who are gonna finance are gonna say, you know, I want, some, I want some interest in it. Because the fact of the matter is, if they could just go to a bank, like a hardware store does, or like a toy store does, that wouldn't be an issue here. They'd retain 100% of it. But you can't go to a bank, you can't get financing, you can't even use a bank in Massachusetts. So 
So you're you're be you're between a rock and a hard place. Uh, my my position is I what I'm trying to get at is if they intend to stay as owners and maintain 50% ownership, it would seem like if we say you can go to 50% that the problem goes away. But you seem not to be uh, amendable to that approach. So I'm is there something I don't know? Are you are you going to sell off 90% of the company to the shareholders? No, there's no intention of doing that, but. Um, at the same time, they don't want to be bound by something that might happen in the future. And if other farmers get involved and they get the interest, it could easily uh, go over 50% to the other farmers. If there are three sites and each farmer has a site and each farmer wanted a third interest in it and you have one investor, all of a sudden there's more than 50% sold off. So that just becomes an impracticable way of doing it. I understand what you're getting. I understand what you're getting at, Joe. You'd like to make sure that it stayed more local. Um, it will stay local in the sense of Massachusetts, but I, that's that's not something they're in, they're interested in doing. They think they, they they don't think they they can't foresee the future. Okay. I mean, they're, they are a business. If they're very successful, and three years from now, someone comes and wants to buy the property, okay, wants to own their property, and they want to sell their property with the business in it, well, they can sell the property anyway because the property is the property. It's not the applicant. But it just doesn't, if in fact, it, it doesn't, if in fact the interest is in how it operates and how it functions, then whether it's 49% or 51% should not make a difference in my opinion. And I'd say the interest is in how it functions and how it operates. And if Guido gets involved, and Guido got approved by the Cannabis Control Commission, you to keep on looking at this property really closely to make sure that it's not violating any of the many conditions you set on it. That's how you deal with you would deal with the Guido problem. Well, I, I think for me, um, one of the reasons this is in the bylaw is many times the government puts things in the laws, but then there's this problem called funding. And if the Cannabis Control Commission doesn't get the budget they want. They can't hire the inspectors or the people to do all this. So by putting it in the bylaw, it gives us a little more edge that we are then in a position to do it. Many times this happens with wetlands bylaws. Yeah, the state law is there, but if the town puts it in, I think it, it gives the town more credibility. They could enforce the wetlands act. So there's this issue. And then there's this issue of these people coming in and buying up uh, the management groups to come in and buy the cannabis company, but they're actually buying control of it as well. So yeah, uh, John and Lisa still own it, but they've given up all rights uh, of any kind to this management company who's going to come in and run the company. And, uh, and I guess I share best concern. That's not what we thought we signed up for. We thought we signed up for a couple of local people and I am willing to bring in other farms. I believe that they need each farm. If they grow their own cannabis, they would have to get a special permit. If they're just going to help John and Lisa raise it on their property, I can understand you wanting to bring them in. But well, we're trying to be straightforward about this. And that's why we came to you asking for this waiver, because there are creative legal ways of, of having uh, management companies not having interest or ownership and simply controlling things, you know? And that's not our, not, not the interest that we have, you know? And they certainly have put their, a lot of money into it. They put a lot of time into it. This has been going on for a couple of years and their intention is to be out there. His intention is to be out there farming and uh, have some employees but he's going to be the one responsible for this. But initially, they need 
uh, money coming in. And I don't think that the town has any, and they, and they need members to create the cooperative. And I don't think the town has any interest in whether it's, again, 49 or 51 percent. And there's no provision in the bylaw for if you're going to transfer it to someone else, you have to come back and talk to us. It's, a, it's an all or nothing. You'd have to come back and they'd have to get a waiver just like we're doing now. And I think we began this process in June. So, you know, getting a waiver is not the easiest thing in the world to do. And if you need money and you need money quickly and somebody says, yeah, I can give you money, but I needed to have 10% of, of the company or 4% of the company, because that was the numbers we were using before, then it has to be done quickly and it can't wait six months or a year or your company goes under. Um, I'm just going to interject here for on behalf of um, our newest member that the, the special permit for Roaring Glen Farms was issued in um, was issued in August of 2020 and it runs for five years. So after five yeah. years, there is a there is a need to um, uh, re issue that. So, right, and it would expire at the end of five years. Yes, so it will expire at the end of five years. And at the end of five years, uh, the new people would come in and you'd ask them, well, who are the principals? Who's, who has the interest? And you'd either at that point in time, approve it or not approve it. Right. The fact of the matter is it's gonna take another, another chunk of time till this place is up and running. And as you know, it's gonna be an outdoor grow which is a very iffy proposition in, in Massachusetts. It may work, but if, but if we have a frost like we used to have 20, 30, 40 years ago, those, of those who, who are here old enough to remember those frosts, we always had a frost by September 15. We don't have a frost till October 30 this year. Who knows? It's the weather. Um, is there any other member of the planning board who has any questions or comments they want to make at this time? And if not, that's fine. Anybody? Did, Bill, did you have a, did you want to speak, Bill? I'm going to unmute you. I think Bill said he wanted to speak, he had a question. He did. It looks like he is speaking, but he's muted. Yeah, I'm going to un. Okay, I got to unmute you. Sorry, everybody. You good? No? No, oh, he's still. He's still muted. Oh, why? Now, now, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, sorry about that. That's uh, fine. I, I'm just, I, I, um, what bothers me is that the, the that the planning board is being involved in in personnel, which is something that really isn't their turf. We we the way the, the way something is run, the way something is run is not our our decision. And so I'm 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 really wondering why why we can think that we can we can manage the company so to speak by telling them that they can only the, the employees have to be uh, vetted or something like that I, I find it really problematic um i'm receiving a, a request from a question from um david um and the way that this will go is that first the planning board can ask questions and make comments and then <clears throat> town department heads, um, <clears throat> excuse me. And uh, after that, a butters and then the public. So we're gonna go in that order. Thank you. But I'll have you on the stack. And so just if you could um, tell me which category you fall in, then we'll call on you when your time comes, okay? Um, thanks, Bill, for that comment. 
Um, anyone else from the planning board have anything they want to ask at this time? And if not, we're going to open up to uh, whoever's here from the town. George has a question. Yes. Um, yeah, just one quick, I don't know if it's a question or an observation. At the beginning of your remarks, Tom, you said that um, uh, 11.5 R required, would require the cooperative to go back to the Cannabis Commission for its review, uh, but you didn't mean to imply that, that they'd have to go through the entire process all over again, right? Uh, I don't see anything in, in 11.5 R that says that. It doesn't even make any reference to the Cannabis Commission. It, it simply refers to the planning board. Well, if we, in order to hold a license, you have to comply with local regulations. So you have to have a special permit in order to hold a valid license. Sure, if your special but that doesn't permit, mean- If your special permit gets revoked, then your, then your license to operate gets revoked also. Uh, but does that automatically mean they'd have to go through the entire process again? Yeah, you have to come back to get a special permit with the planning board initially. Locally, and have, sure, I get that part, locally. but and uh, then you have to go back. Then you go back to the board, because the board has to. It's revoked if, if the board doesn't have the authority uh, to operate locally. It's automatically revoked, just like if you violated the 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 host community agreement. They took away your host community agreement, then your license is null and void. Right. It just sounded like a little bit of hyperbole to suggest that that they would have to go back to the commission square one and, and spend two years going through the whole process again. Um, it's unfortunate. It's, my... it, it's unfortunate hyperbole, George. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I'd say, you know, it's, it, but, but it's, but it's back, you know. Um, Does okay. this, would, would, um, would this change the host community agreement at all? If, no. if there was a change in, okay. The structure no, I mean, Rory, Rory Glenn Farms LLC. Is still is still the applicant. Okay. It was with them. Okay. That wouldn't change at all. Okay. It would be the makeup of the cooperative that would change. Right. So, um, unless there's other people in the planning board who want to have uh, follow up questions or questions, I'm going to turn to the next level of folks, um, which would be. Um, Who's here from the town? Bob Armstrong, if you have any, uh, basically Bob is here as um, select board. I'm not here as a select board. I'm here because oh, okay. I'm interested in the hearing and- Well, uh, no, I don't I'm think you, can, you can't, you can't forget that you're a person of the select board. So you do get to be called on if you have- I understand, board. I appreciate it. I, I wouldn't have said anything if you didn't okay. call me out. So anyway, thank you. All right, okay, great. So now whoever's here as an abutter, um, they can um, let us know that they're here and they can speak with questions. And if that isn't anybody, I'm not seeing anybody, um, I'm gonna call on David DeLuca, the member of the public. Hello, thank you. Um, someone brought up the uh, suggestion that um, the town has no proper role in uh, the the question of how a business is run. But I, to my way of thinking, that would fall under the wording of manner, which is already uh, in place. And so, wouldn't the manner of operation of a business uh, encompass? this question that's before you? That's a good question, Tom. Do you want to handle that one? Oh, you sure. A, I, mean, I mean, sure. I mean, ma manner by, by, by the definary, by the, well, it's, it's the matter of marijuana establishment operations first. Um, and manner uh, means how something operates. And I say, yeah, you certainly have a right to regulate how something operates. And you've done that with your conditions and you've done that with all the parts of the bylaws, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, L, M, N, O, O, you know? 
Um, it, it doesn't say the, a regular manner doesn't mean how's, how who controls an operation. It doesn't mean who has the ownership. And that's something that I agree that the planning board is ill-equipped to do. I think the planning board has the right to talk about the operations themselves and operations, the, the, the definition of operations is how it functions. That's the definition, dictionary definition. And that's what uh, statutes go by. That's what local ordinances go by. Um, if that's the case, then why is the word manner included separately? Why didn't they just use operations and leave the word manner out? Because it's the time, manner, and ma time, place, and manner in the, in the state statute. And manner means how things operate. But if that's the case, then manner and operations are, uh, uh, it's, it's a duplicate term. It's a duplicate application, manner and operations. So manner must mean something different than operations. Well, it, it, the legal term is time, place, and manner. It's just how it's used. Time means hours of operation, place means location, and manner means how it operates. Yeah, but it's but the statute, the state statute, talks about time, place, and manner. It doesn't talk about. Um, it doesn't define time. It doesn't define place. This is manner of marijuana establishment operations. It could be the manner of anything. Just how it's I done. Change? I'm sorry. Is it okay if I change gears here? Uh, yes. Oh, well, thank you. Uh, one other thing that caught my attention um, uh, was the question of uh, uh, since the state has the Cannabis Control Commission in place um, and uh, who's really providing oversight here um, and why should the town be involved at all? And uh, I think that um, since, as far as I know, no one on the Cannabis Control Commission lives locally, maybe I'm wrong about that, um, but since uh, we, the local residents, have to deal with the consequences, whatever they may be, there will be consequences of one sort or another, maybe they're good, maybe they're bad, maybe they're mixed, but we live here, and that's why uh, the people here should be involved, that, to my way of thinking, again, just my opinion. Thank you. And, Thank and you, all, David. And, and all I'd say is that your bylaw talks about regulating the locations of site development. That's totally appropriate. You should be regulating, and that's local. You should be regulating the location and site development. You should be locating, you should be regulating what happens on the site itself. But there's no place for you when the Cannabis Control Commission already vets people to be Revetting them, which is essentially what you would be doing. You'd be duplicating what they've already done and perhaps for some unknown reason, reaching a different determination. Mm -hmm. So, um, I'm reminding anyone who's here attending this to put their name and address in the chat so we can we can just sign in this way because we need a record of who's here. Um, this meeting is being recorded and will be um, available on the town website. Um, I'm not sure if there's no more if there's no further questions or comments from anyone. Um, and I'm not seeing any. Actually, I think um, even though it's eight o'clock, we're scheduled to go till nine o'clock with this, but we can, correct me if I'm wrong here, Joe, we can close the public hearing portion of this and continue with the um, planning board meeting to deliberate uh, a little tonight. Isn't that correct? Yes, he's saying yes, but he, I don't hear him. I'm interpreting. Yes, you can do that. Uh, you just would close the public hearing portion of the meeting? Yeah. What do people on the planning board think about that? Do you, do you feel 
like we've come to the end of what we need to gather in terms of information uh, on this question? Um, and are we ready to close the public hearing and talk about um, the implications of this? What do you think? Group, my group of us? Let's move on. Yeah? <clears throat> Feels okay to go. What do you think, Jen? Uh, I yeah, I am okay. I mean, I could continue the conversation. I'm, I'm, you know, it's interesting to hear what Tom says. What I think, you know, we're sort of treading on the realm of prognostication out a little farther than I think we're all equipped to to look at this point. So it might be wise to stop now. I guess I did have one question. Um, it's um, Tom, you weren't you are in the room, so I'm not sure you can answer it. It would be probably more a question for John and Lisa that when we were first meeting with them, I think we were still COVID because we were in the town hall and in person. Um, one of the planning board members asked John and Lisa, would there be any other funding? because at some point someone somewhere thought they had seen some, maybe it was that other name that you just referenced and said that was a person who was involved early on. But in any event, one of the planning board members had noticed in some documentation, another name and questioned the applicants whether there would be funding from any other sources. Um, and they answered unequivocally, no, it was their, you know, it was their baby. It was their thing, just the two of them. Now, while that may or may not have been the case at the time, I mean, it sounds like I'm sort of wondering if if something did happen where there was a change of maybe a change of plan, a change of I mean, you did, Tom, uh, point out that obviously to undertake a project of this size would be uh, financially impossible for, you know, your average farmer, uh, which is understandable, but that's where I do wonder um, why, you know, if there was this model all along in the in people's minds and why wasn't that brought up, you know, when we were, this was like pre, we were having like a pre-special permit application meeting, just going over everything with them and just making sure that, you know, that everything was dotted and crossed, so to speak. So I don't well, know I think, who to speak to that. Yeah, I, I can really, I, can, I can't speak to that. I mean, it was their intention in the beginning that they would personally fund this, and it was their intention all along. It was their intention before they were, even when they were before the Cannabis Control Commission. But it's only recently that it is it is sunk in that the reality of hiring people and hiring employees and going forward at this point requires uh, more money than they have available, personally. Mm -hmm. Just don't they just can't make it right i mean yeah. understandable but i i think then you know our position is also that therefore you know from from that flows our current uh you know sort of conundrum with how how to okay so they changed you know things changed so you know that's kind of where we are now too is examining what that change implies for our processes i think and I think that's right. And I think that I'm asking you to uh, consider this waiver, which had been asked for before, you know, right. nobody paid any attention to you 11 R, you know, I, I certainly looked at these bylaws at one point. And, you know, I think Joe asked me to look at the bylaws at one point, or maybe I did it on my own and talk, talk to Joe about it. Mm -hmm. I, didn't, I didn't look at 11 R, but I don't think back three years ago, I realized that and now that I'm, you know, advising people and people come to my office all the time and say, well, I want to open up a, you know, a retail store. And I said, yeah, <laughs> do, you have, do you have $4 million? You know? <laughs> right. Get in line. <laughs> you know, if you, if you want to do indoor cultivation, you have $6 million, you know, you know, it's, yeah. it's just extraordinarily expensive to do. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, and I don't think anybody, oh. I'm not sure everybody, anybody realized how, how intense it was in the beginning three years ago. And, that's, and that is perfectly acceptable. And, and actually, you know, the 
the best potential answer that I could think of because I just I like I said I just did want to clarify because I do remember that the question was asked um you know again as Beth pointed out it we may have sort of as a group failed to dig deeper into the concept of a uh, cooperative because as every you know most of us know just from common knowledge what the term in implies and entails. I mean, you pay in and, and you're and you're a shareholder, so, so to speak, uh, you know, we get the little 46 cents back every year from the, from the co-op. We get our little check. So, okay, well, thank you very much, Tom. Sure, it's also, it was, it's just a brand new industry. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, you know, and this is, I mean, that's where we, you know, and that's where we all are. It's, it's a brand, it's a, it's a, certainly a case of first impression for for us and you know yeah so. um george has a question but i'm not ready to call on him yet because i have a slight technical problem i need to like go charge this tablet that i'm using up um so i might disappear for a little while but um uh whoever just recently joined us please note um your name and your address in the chat uh we are at the portion of the public hearing where we are uh, accepting uh, comments from the public. And if you want to speak, uh, let us know, whoever you are. And um, um, I'm listening, but I'm going off camera for a little while. I'll be back in a minute. OK. OK. So I don't see anything in the chat. My chat went away. <laughs> Don't, don't you love the technical issues? Um, so it, there, it looks like someone here named Alex Chin, who's on mute. Maybe you could unmute yourself. Yeah, hi, sorry. Um, so I have the property. So I'm Dorothy Osterman's son. And we, we're just- uh, A Butters? Say again? Are you a Butters? Uh, a butter. Do you a butt property? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm on the other side of uh, Waitley Glen at the uh, was it it's the northeast corner of Waitley Glen and Roaring Brook. Okay. Um. So did you have a question? No, a I I had meant I had intended to to listen to. You oh, okay. <laughs> the okay. meeting and I I got my times mixed up because I'm in uh, Central Standard Time and, and oh I, I see got all mixed up and so I just thought I'd stop in and see. Okay. So. Well, thank you. <laughs> Joe? While we're waiting for Beth, I'll, I'll do one more question for Tom. Uh, Tom, if we strike that whole section, it seems to me we've given up, given up, the planning board has given up all rights to do anything forever after on this special permit. Clarify that for me. Oh, I think you, 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 you're only giving up a right with regard to the ownership. You're not giving up any rights with regard to the conditions that you've placed on it or the other conditions that the planning board bylaws place on it. So it it's, it's solely to do with ownership until this special permit expires. So since we're, let's say, over a year into it, we're really talking about who might own or have an interest more than 10% during the next three and a half years. At the end of five years, it's, there's no obligation for the planning board to renew the special permit. So, so let me clarify then, for the next, for the remainder of the five year license, we have, we have no rights regarding the future of the property, whether it gets sold, unsold, who owns it, all, who runs it, all that kind of stuff. A management company can come in. As long as it's approved by the Cannabis Control Commission, we have no say. Well, no, um, you, you don't have any say on who owns the property to begin with, okay? That, that can be sold tomorrow, okay? The only thing you have any control over is the applicant who, who is Roaring Glen Farms, Inc. And this has to do with, R has to do with ownership or interest. 
it actually doesn't have anything to do with management company. They mm -hmm. can have a manager, which is a side and a part, in, unless there's something in the, maybe there is something in your bylaws concerning managers, and I don't have them in front of me, so I can't say offhand, mm -hmm. but um, if there's something in your bylaws about managers and coming to the board and having managers approved, then that, that's still in effect. This only has to do with ownership or interest in the LLC, the craft cooperative itself. Mm -hmm. Has nothing to do with the property, ownership of the property. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, let's see if this works for me. <laughs> um, Joe, did that answer your, do you have any more to say about that particular? I'm done. You got thoughts? Okay. Um, Alex, I just want to point out to you that this is, this has been recorded and it will be available um, on the town website. Thanks. So the entire public hearing. So, um, um, I'm a little nervous because I think my tablet's going to die here and uh, then I'm going to disappear. So then I'll probably have to call in or something. Um, so um, I'm going to turn to Jen to take over if I can just there. Thank you very much. Um, where are we at now, group? We want to close the public hearing section and, and talk amongst ourselves. Yeah. yeah. I'm okay with that. Yeah. I think that's what we're going to do. Um, David is asking why is he the only person who's public who put his address in the chat? Well, maybe because no one else is good with directions. So um, everyone <laughs> needs to put their address in the chat because that's part of signing in to the public hearing. It's a requirement. Um, so uh, we don't, uh, that's not true for the plan. I, I suppose it's true for the planning board. Is it true for us too? Oh, oh no, none of us listen to directions either. So um, yeah, this is for our, our uh, uh, administrative assistant to capture everyone who's here is very important. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, so um, while you're all doing that, I think we can um, Uh, close the section, close the public hearing and turn to deliberating. Um, Can I just say one thing, Beth? Yes, absolutely. Uh, I, I would just point out um, that there are, there is no one who, David raised some questions, uh, David DeLuca, but there's no one who spoke in opposition to this. And that's a real contrast to your hearings that I didn't, that I was not part of when you were going over the special permit where there was huge opposition and many people spoke on many issues. Yes. So it doesn't seem to be a particularly live issue for the public. That's true. Yeah, that's a good thing to, thank you for pointing that out. Um, which also reminds me in the past public hearing, we have uh, continued to accept public comment up to a certain point. Um, is that something we wanna consider? Doesn't feel like, I mean, I have... Any, any planning board person have a thought on that? That we could leave public comment open up until a certain date, maybe up until our next meeting? Mm -hmm. I, at this point, I don't think it's necessary, but you're welcome okay. to do it. I, th I think we should leave it open. Um, I mean, you know, okay. and choose a date certain because I do think that, you know, the time busy holiday season type thing, people may, you know, there may be people who feel that they would need to weigh in and weren't able to either get here or, um, you know, formulate a question in time or something. So I don't think it would hurt the overall cause for everybody to be able to feel heard. All right. I think we, I'm going to propose that we um, accept public comment on this uh, through our next, date of our next meeting, which is December 16th. Um, and, and that can be done by emailing the planning board at planningboard at townofconway.org. 
www.ghostsofthecoast.com. And we'll make that uh, public knowledge on the website somehow tomorrow. And which reminds me, Tom, um, we are presuming that you intended that memo that you sent us to be part of the public record. Is that right? Yes, I did. All right. Absolutely. Okay. All right. That will also be posted then on the website. Um, uh, anything else? If not, I'm going to ask for someone to move that we uh, close the public hearing at this point in time and turn to deliberation. Yeah. I will make a motion that we close the public hearing on the Brewer England Farms matter at this time and uh, deliberate as a planning board. Yes. Joel Stogowski, I'll second that. Great. All in favor. And remember, this has to be a roll call vote because it is on Zoom. So all in favor. Beth Gershman, aye. Jennifer no, Collins, aye. No, maybe it's aye. Joel Stogowski, aye. George Forcier, aye. Okay, great. So this public hearing is closed, although we will continue to accept public comment. Uh, through December 16th at 5 p.m. Um, and, and until our next meeting. So thank you all. Um, I'm, I presume the public can still stick around for this portion of what we're gonna do for the next, I'd say, little bit of time. We have an, another hour um, scheduled so we can we can start talking about what we heard and how we want to apply it and what we think um, just in terms of how to interpret this request. Anybody ready? You want me to start again? <laughs> sure. I'm of course. Happy to start. Yeah. I, I, I have absolutely no problem with getting rid of the 10%. I, I just feel like if we totally eliminate that section, that that we're we're setting our set up setting ourselves up for a massive pushback at some point. And I don't know where it'll come from. I do believe that marijuana is totally different than any other business. Um, why is all there why is there this extensive licensing process and this vetting process? If this was plain old business the government wouldn't get involved at this level either. So saying the town can't be involved, but the government can, doesn't feel right to me. I, it seems to me we should have some rights in this licensing process. When, when you do liquor licenses, towns get involved. So to me, this is a quasi business licensing process. And so I feel like we're giving it all away here, but um, I, but you I, don't have a problem with the t changing the 10 percent. No, I realize in, that, case. Uh, in, in spite of the fact that we weren't told that this was going to be a co-op with all these small ownerships, you know, many small owners uh, that was not presented to my knowledge anywhere along the way. And mm -hmm. when, we, when we issued the license, everything at the um, Cannabis Control Commission and everything we saw as a town said, Roaring Glen Farms LLC, 50% owned by Lisa, 50% owned by John. And it, it was it was never even hinted that it was going to change. And now, you know, we're, we haven't even started yet. And here we are, we're going to have 20 members or some quantity of, of members. Um, I don't know. That's the part that bothers me, I guess. I don't have a, I don't have a good answer. We could require that everything that gets submitted, as Tom said, to the Cannabis Control Commission, we get a copy of it. So then we can, uh, we can react to it. You know, we won't be proactive, but we could, we could react to anything we don't like if we see it. You know? um, what if the local cops know something about somebody that's applying and the Cannabis Control Commission doesn't know anything about it? You know? um, I mean, I guess, I guess if we if we have the list of all the applicants and it's updated yearly, maybe that's the only compromise we can ask for. Okay. So as part of the order of conditions, you would require that a list be updated every year and submitted to the planning board, or would it be more than it well, as it happened? Something along <laughs> those lines, I guess. But um, the other thing is there... Um, 
post agreement, I believe, requires that they notify the select board of any change in managers. I think there's there is something that they are required to give to the select board. I don't yeah. think it's as extensive as uh, vetting every member, but there is there are some requirements in the post agreement. Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, um, I I <clears throat> I agree that because of the nature of this business, the town does have an we do have an interest in this. There's just no question about that in my mind. The question in my mind is how far does it go and how how possible is it in in, in terms of this particular section of the bylaw? Um, and I wish this had all been brought up when we originally deliberated the special permit and it seems like it could have been and it wasn't. So that's kind of my, uh, I'm not sure what it is. I'm, I'm unhappy about that basically. But um, I'm, I'm certainly willing to figure out how we can do this without um, setting a precedent for um, our own bylaws. I want to have a way to keep the integrity of our bylaws that we worked on and we passed and were vetted and approved by the attorney general with and and find a way to make a compromise here um, so that this business can operate. Um, that's where I'm at with it. So that's and um, Bill George Jen. Uh, are we still waving our hands? What are we doing? Yeah, well, you can wave your hand, but I'm not can sure you, if I'd see it. <laughs> but you can, can talk. You, I can even see my hand. Uh, I'm 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 waving my hand. Go. <laughs> um, it, we're struggling with the Guido factor, right? I mean, we're we're struggling with the question of how much control should the town officials, the planning board, have over who runs the farm. Um, and, so, and, I, yeah. and, I, and yeah, and I, there's sort of an intuitive desire to do that I, that I feel because, as I said, if, if my cousin uh, were to have an interest in that farm, I'd be really concerned. Um, so that that makes sense to me. On the other hand, um, I just was looking at the the um, license or the or the site, the the special permit that we that was issued. Um, and it starts out in the beginning of it, it talks about, um, gosh, where is it? I've lost it. It talks about per legal counsel's advice, the alleged character or behavior of an applicant is beyond the scope and intention of mass zoning regulations. It will not be considered by the planning board in its special permit or site plan decisions. Right. Yeah. That sounds to me like even if we discovered that some bad actors were, were buying into the farm that yeah. we couldn't take that into account, mm -hmm. which raises the question of why that provision, that that, that, that provision, um, whatever this uh, 11.5R is toothless. Uh, mm -hmm. That once we found out who the, the, the new owners are, and if we don't like them, there's apparently nothing we can do about it. Um, so that that seems kind of peculiar. Um, it sounds like the only thing maybe that could be done is, is we find out who these new owners are, and and if Kenny Wamet decides that they're bad actors, uh, you know, we, we, what can we do? We can go running to the to the uh, cannabis commission, presumably, because <clears throat> they do have the right to pull that license for uh, because they don't like the the, 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 the backgrounds of the people in question. Mm -hmm. um, I just said as a practical matter, I'm not sure how we would, um, what criteria we would use to judge the fitness of a, of a, um, a prospective owner um, in trying to grant a new application. Uh, if, if, if the preamble to the current site plan approval says we're not supposed to take into account character and behavior of applicants. Good I point. Didn't explain that too well. No, you did. No, that's a good point. Um, 
Well, I guess, George, we're totally in the hands of the Cannabis Control Commission. They can they can vet or not vet whatever they want to do, and we're we're stuck with it. Well, in Tom's under Tom's scenario, that's that's yes, right. That's that's the way he would have it. Um, um, even if we were, even if they were kind enough to tell us who the owners were as they came on board, um, short of pulling the rug out from under them, invoking um, 11.5R, and then when you do that and you and they apply with the new people, it's like okay. Uh, it, the operation is the same. There's nothing different except the the names of the owners, and and we're not supposed to judge the owners except based on their um, operational behaviors. So I, I just kind of wonder how functional that that provision really is ultimately. Yeah. Is, you know, as much as Question. I would like to control who runs what. Um, yeah. It is. I, I have noticed, though, in the in the learning phase of this whole thing, it's really difficult to find. There is a public aspect to the Cannabis Control Commission information. It's super hard to figure it out. Mm. So I am thinking that it would be better if we could find some compromise where we would be provided with information ahead of time, as Tom, or, or in the moment, as Tom suggested, they'd be willing to do. So that. Uh, because I don't want it to be on on any planning board member to be constantly researching the cannabis site to see who's what's happening. I don't I don't want it to be that difficult. Mm -hmm. um, I'd prefer the information to be provided to us rather than us having to go search for it. And because it's not something that the Cannabis Control Commission is going to update you on all the time. It doesn't appear to be anyway in my experience, in our experience with them. So some sort of order of conditions in which it, that's mentioned, I'd be amenable to that. Um, Jen or Bill, I know Bill, you're, you're thinking we should figure out a way to move on from this. <laughs> well, I, I, I would like to, to think, to just really realize that we have limitations as a board in terms of, hello? Yeah, no, yeah, we, have, we hear we you. Have limitation, we have limitations as a board that we, we can't choose personality as a, as a, as a criteria or right. a, a person, those personal things are out of the picture. It, we are about what, how this is going to affect the community. And if it's a farm, it's a farm. And mm -hmm. who, who runs the farm might become a friend, but it, he, he or she might also not become a friend. <laughs> that's, that, that's, I see, I, I think we need to detach ourselves a little bit from the okay. expected poison and, and, and darkness of all this. Mm -hmm. That's very eloquent. <laughs> <laughs> Spoken like the father of a toddler. <laughs> so, so let me play devil's advocate. What if next week sure. the Cannabis Control, Control Commission says, we're not going to do any background checks. Whoever wants to come out and work can go ahead and work. Well, well where would that leave us? We wouldn't as a town be able to do background checks on no, anyone but, either. But we'd have something in our bylaw that would stop that. Without, oh, that, without that clause... We just have to go along with the state. If they change the laws, and we don't have any money, we can't pay to do this. We're going to drop that requirement. Well, we're not talking about changing our bylaw. This is not a hearing to change our bylaw. This is a hearing to figure out how to. Well, I mean, if we waive that requirement, we basically changed our bylaw for this applicant. For this applicant only. <laughs> right. Right. So next week, Canvas announced we're not checking backgrounds anymore. I can't not imagine that happening. They want, you know? <laughs> I don't see how that's going to happen, yeah. considering how how many how long it took the state to put all this into place. Yeah. Yeah. <sighs> what, do you have any thoughts, yeah. Jen, that are that we haven't covered? No. Um, I, no. I have a question for Joe. I think if I can butt in. Yeah. This isn't butting um, in. This is discussion. It's okay. It has to do with the liquor uh, the license analogy. I think Joe raised um, at present. Yeah. 
um, if a liquor license holder in town uh, wants to sell, change the license or change their bartender manager, aren't there? Doesn't the selectman have to know about that and approve it? Aren't there pretty rigid constraints that way? I don't think it goes to the bartender level. I don't. I don't. Think, like, I don't think it goes down to the. I, I think maybe the ownership or the manager. Yeah, I mean, like they have to apply for a new license. Basically, they have to apply for a new license every year, and yeah. that that would be when the when the town would normally bring those issues up. But the ABCC basically just countersigns those things, right? But, I mean, it does happen at both levels of government. Right. The selectmen approve the license and the manager and the owner of the license, and then the ABCC kind of concurs. I believe that's correct. Yeah. Yeah. But then, then the law was set up that way. It's not a local ordinance that created the the local control in the uh, liquor license case. Well, there is a certain analogy between the liquor, the business, uh, the, the liquor stores, and and marijuana retail. I mean, yeah. there's a certain amount of it that feels like it's based a lot on that. Mm -hmm. um, But I guess we're not sure if if the select board has anything to do if the local government. Well, yeah, the local government yeah, they can do. Grant they do. A, yeah. a license or not. It's a two tier um, system. What I don't know is whether that was established by state law. You know, but that and I'm pretty sure they established the local select men or licensing board as the local licensing authority with that that power. So it's kind of a different setup. In this case, the state set it up with the CCC and almost total control, um, except apparently when local communities like ours took it upon themselves to, to um, uh, establish that authority. Well, you either, you, as a town, you could either have, uh, well, it's more complicated than this, but you could either have sort of um, created bylaws specifically for it, uh, completely said it was impossible to do in your town or done neither. And then it sort of falls into the um, um, category of just going by state regulation. Yeah. Is that right? Being, Tom, I'm sure will tell me if I'm incorrect here, but you know, it's a little, it's a little different. So there's some towns that did nothing and then other towns that went our route and other towns that went an entirely different route and made slightly more, you know, it just, it's a, it is kind of a town by town decision. Um, where are we at, you guys? Are, we're not, I don't feel ready to make a final decision on this, like, especially because we said we'd accept public comment until December 16th. So I think um, <clears throat> personally, I think it would be good if we could come prepared, you know, to continue this discussion on December 16th and make a decision hopefully by the end of that meeting. Good. Does that sound good? Yes. Yeah. Sounds great. Okay. That's what we're going to do. So um, mm -hmm. that means we're going to close this part of the, of the, of our meeting and, um, and come back together again on December 16th. <laughs> At six, um, Beth, this is what George. What time? At 6 p.m. Yeah. George. At six, did you say seven. 6 p.m.? At 7. No, okay. at, seven, at 7. Okay. Six, uh, my, my, I'm assuming that before the 16th, we would see copies of whatever additional comments come in? Yes, absolutely. I'll share them with people for sure. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Oh. <laughs> Thanks, Tom. He's mentioning about more about we have our we have an expert here on things on legal things like this. Um, yes, they do an extensive background check. That's good because uh, we don't want George's cousin Guido doing anything in our town. It sounds like no, no. Okay, all right. Okay. If he manages um, to get out of prison. <laughs> <laughs> all right. All right. Um, any any other comments or questions or anything like that? Otherwise, I'm going to ask somebody to make a motion to close this meeting. I'll so, make a motion to close the meeting. Okay. Who's going to second it? I second it. Okay. 
Um, all in favor, remember this is a roll call vote. Aye, Beth Gershman. Aye, Joe. Aye, Jennifer Mullins. <laughs> Aye, Bill. It's on you, George. Oh, I'm sorry, I got stepped on. I, George, for <laughs> sorry, George. <laughs> I didn't I'm going to go, I'm gonna make people go in alphabetical order next time. Yeah, that's yeah. a good idea. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, thank you all very, very much. Uh, this was this was an interesting time. <laughs>